Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your lunch. Please continue eating. Uh, but during the, this lunch, uh, we have a true gift, which is having Heather Boucher uh, give a presentation to us. So Heather, if you don't know her, you should. She's one of the most highly respected economists in Washington. Uh, her full bio is in your program, so I'm not going to read out all of her impressive credentials. But uh, you should know that a few years ago, she set up an organization called the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, which she now leads. Uh, in DC, there are a lot of think tanks, but she's figured out a really novel niche uh, in a city filled with many great think tanks. They take a slightly different approach uh, and uh, offer grants to academics to bring more fact-based fact -based research to policymakers. They're specifically focused on research to promote strong, stable, and broad-based economic growth. We're also honored to have her on the policy board of the Biden Institute here at the University of Delaware. With that, I don't want to take up any more time from her, so I will turn it over to her for a presentation. We are going to have audience question and answer after she speaks, so please uh, have some questions ready. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, um, and thank you all. This is, um, it's a real treat to be here today, and um, I've been very pleased to be able to be a part of the, um, the policy group that, Biden, that uh, Vice President Biden put together, and I'm happy to, to, I think this is my first actual stop in Delaware. Of course, I've gone through it on the train many times, but I was excited to get off the train today and see what it was like. Um, so hopefully another time I can spend more time. Um, so I want to talk to you a little about today, today about um, questions about what makes the economy grow. How do we create growth that is strong, stable, and broadly shared? And I want to start with just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an economist, um, and part of the reason I'm an economist is because something very important happened to my family when I was a little kid. I was either 11 or 12, I'm not sure. Um, but at some point during the early 80s recession, um, my dad got laid off. He got the dreaded pink slip. He was a machinist at the Everett Boeing Company, where they make the 747s, the biggest landmass building in the world, I still think today. And um, Every little kid at my bus stop, where there was about 50 kids, a little suburban neighborhood, um, everybody's parent was on layoff. And I was really struck by how much power this big company just a mile up the street had over not just my life, but the life of everybody in my community. And of course, just being a little kid, I was mostly concerned about whether or not I we were going to have enough money for me to stay on swim team. So that was very important to me then. But these are the kinds of things that working families, families in the middle class all across America, think about and worry about is, is the, is the economy performing for them? And can they afford the things that actually matter, that make their lives better? And I ended up becoming an economist. And one of the things that you learn when you become an economist is that there are some very clear paths to creating the kinds of growth that we need to see. And one of them is the idea that we have this free market and that um, it's going to create this, um, uh, this economic vitality as long as we have all of these you know, various factors of production able to do what they do best. And if we focus on allowing the free market to work, then you're going to see this kind of economic growth. And that people will be paid their fair wage. They're going to be paid their marginal product. And that this is um, going to help support productivity growth because you're going to encourage greater productivity because people are going to get more skills, they're going to work hard. And so as a policymaker, our role is to ensure that um, growth is stable through sort of Keynesian demand side policies, but also most importantly, by ensuring that we have long-term productivity growth. And if we take care of that, then everything, the chips should sort of fall where they may, but everything should be pretty darn good. And um, for a long time, that was the case. So this is a chart that shows average income growth, which is the purple line across the, that goes across the horizontal line, 1.7% between 1963 and 1979. And it shows the growth for each income group um, by deciles from 0 to 100. And as you can see, for both pre- and post-tax income, over that 20-year period from the 1960s to 1970s, the economy grow, grew by 1.7%. And about 2 thirds of Americans saw growth that was equal to average growth. So so long as policymakers focused on productivity and kept sort of the, the business cycle at bay, then you know everybody was gaining from growth. And in fact, 
growth was even stronger for those at the bottom of the income distribution. So this led uh, President John F. Kennedy to famously say in 1963, I believe, that a rising tide lifts all boats. So long as we focus on growth, well then, we're gonna lift everyone up and it's gonna lift up those at the bottom the most. And the role of those of us that focus on economic policy is just to make sure that, that we focus on this rising tide. That was our mandate. Now, of course, a lot's changed since then. And I wanna point out three key differences. First, where average growth between 1963 and 79 was 1.7%, since then, 1980 to 2014, average growth has only been 1.4%. So we're actually seeing less growth now than we used to. So that's thing one. But thing two is that the way that growth is distributed across our economy is dramatically different than in that earlier period. This chart could not be more different than the one I just showed you. So not only is average growth lower, the vast majority of those gains from growth are going to those at the very top. In fact, it is only those in the top 10% of the income distribution that see at least the average national growth. So the bottom 90%, they're all seeing growth that is less than the average for the nation. Um, and, uh, and it goes down. And this is for both pre- and post-tax income. And you know, growth is, slow, is slower the further down the income distribution you go. And of course, it's exceptionally high for those at the very, very top of the income distribution. So it's statistics like these that led Gene Sperling, who advised both President Obama and President Clinton, to say a rising tide will lift some boats, but others will run aground, which is exactly what we see here in the chart. And this paints a very different picture for my job and the role of people that do economic policy. If we're advising policymakers, it's a very different story in terms of what our role is. I can't just go to a policymaker today and say, oh, just focus on productivity growth and everything will be fine, because that's certainly not, it's not been the experience over my lifetime in terms of the economy. The third fact, that um, this new change in the economy brings to the forefront is that we used to be a nation of opportunity. We used to be the case that no matter where you sat on the income distribution, unless you were extremely wealthy, you were likely to out-earn your parents. So this blue line shows um, for people who were born in 1940, the probability that they grew up and earned more than their parents as adults was uh, 90%. 90% of people born in 1940 earned more than their parents as grown-ups. If you're born in 1960, it became a little less likely that you out-earned your parents. Still, um, you know, more likely at the bottom, but certainly less likely over time. If you fast forward to those people who were born in 1980, Many of the young, young voters out there, you know, 1980, these folks are just, you know, hitting their 40s, um, which is great, by the way. Um, <laughs> those folks, uh, only half of them, when they reached adulthood, are out earning their parents. And we wonder why they are frustrated and they're upset that they've got all this student debt and they feel that they can't make ends meet. Their life experience, their opportunity has become dramatically different over time. Now, mobility isn't just about a, one person's experience and maybe their frustration with the economy. It's also about productivity growth, right? Because unless you think that all the really productive and smart and talented people were born to rich parents, if you have less mobility, that says something about whether or not there is opportunity across our economy that is allowing talent to flourish and to be, um, uh, to be able to be actualized in the economy in its most productive way. And I'll come back to that, but the mobility, I mean, we think of this often about this story about the American dream, but we also have to think about the productivity-related constraints. And so I want you to think back to that chart I showed you that growth is lower today than it was in the 1960s and 70s on average, and mobility is lower as well, and those two ideas actually might be profoundly connected. 
So this all leads to some fundamental questions for economists. As I said, it, it changes my job. My job is much more difficult than it would have been in the 60s or 70s. Some days I'm annoyed by that. But it is much more difficult because we have to have different answers. We have to understand this whether and how inequality affects growth and whether or not how, why growth isn't delivering for the, America, for the vast majority of American people. So I have spent my entire career thinking about the questions that motivated me when I was a little kid. How is it that policymakers can promote growth that is strong, stable, and broadly shared? If you get on my website and you look at all the things I've written, it's all about this fundamental question about how we can support America's middle class, how we can create those good jobs and that economic vitality. And I've always focused on this question about how we can improve living standards. Um, so it's a very much an economics question. There's a lot that isn't in there. And I'm not thinking so much about the, um, the environmental implications of economic growth. We can come back to that maybe in the Q&A. But thinking about how it is that we improve living standards up and down the income distribution. And one of the most exciting things um, that I've seen over the course of my career is that as we've seen these trends change in economics, we actually have many, many more tools. And when I say many, many, I would like to bold and underline the many, many more tools from economists to actually understand what's happening in our economy. It used to be the case that economics was a very theoretical field. If you wanted to publish in a top journal, you could just write something without equations and theorize, and that was great. And you could talk about aggregates and sort of big ideas. Today, if you want to be an economist and, and, be, and publish in a top journal or work at a, one of the best schools, you are an empirical economist. And you're working with big data. We have so much data that we have access to. And using these very advanced, sophisticated empirical techniques that allow us to show causality, to actually say one thing is causing another. So this revolution in economics is changing the way we're thinking about what makes the economy grow. And quite frankly, it couldn't happen at a more important time because I have, as somebody who advises policymakers, I've got a lot of questions now about how to make the economy grow that need answers. So I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about some of the things that I've learned over the past you know, five or 10 years in thinking about what makes the economy grow and the role of inequality. And um, I'm going to break them down into three buckets. So the title of my uh, talk today is Freeing Growth. So that's the theme. How is it that we can free growth? And I want to argue that um, there, there are three ways that, that, that right now inequality is shackling growth, where there's a lot of empirical evidence from economists with these advanced fancy methods showing causality that describes the various ways that inequality shackles growth. I'm going to break them into three groups. So the first is that inequality shackles growth by distorting demand. So when you see that picture that I showed you of the changes across the income distribution and that people at the bottom have less money than they used to, this has very significant implications for our macro economy. It has very significant implications for both consumption and demand. We know that people at the top end of the income distribution are likely to save more, they're likely to spend less. So just the fact that you have more money flowing to the top affects consumption. And it also has had demonstrable effects on who takes on debt and when in the life cycle in ways that have been, as we've seen over the past decade, destabilizing to the macro economy. And there's nothing worse for growth than a deep, dark recession. Right? We know that it's taken us a decade to even come close to recovering. And we're we'll, we are, we, there's lost output that we will never recover because of the recession. So anything that destabilizes growth is also dragging it down. So you see that on the side of consumption, but you also see because there's more savings flowing through the economy that inequality is distorting where that savings is going and whether or not it's going to investments that are going to improve productivity or whether or not it's going into unproductive endeavors, more debt or um, you know, the kind of uh, chair buybacks we've been seeing and all sorts of different uh, distortions of the investment process. And there's, um, I just spent all day yesterday at a full day conference uh, where a number of, of economists were presenting research on these questions. And this young uh, 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 PhD student is about to graduate from Brown talking about the distortions of inequality on consumption and investment in this cutting edge research. So I'm happy to talk about that more if you want. But 
This is one way that inequality is shackling growth. A second way is that inequality obstructs the supply of people and good ideas to the marketplace. This has a profound and deep effect on productivity and growth. So it's doing it in a, in a couple of ways. So on the one hand, there is now a whole new vibrant body of research in economics documenting how there's an increase in the concentration of capital, and the concentration of firms across their economy, what economists call monopoly power, and that that has an effect on the ability of new firms to enter into marketplaces, which has an effect on long-term productivity, or it can have an effect on long-term productivity. So we're seeing this increased concentration and obstruction of new ideas at the top of the income distribution. You're also seeing it at the bottom. There's a lot of empirical evidence about how, and I alluded to it when I talked about mobility, because of inequality, you've got a lot of people who have a lot of talent or could have good ideas that aren't getting the education that they need. They aren't getting access to health care or basic services or whatever it is that they need as children to grow up and become the kinds of productive members of society that our economy needs them to be. And that's affecting our long-term productivity path. Um, some research in this field is actually traced back inequality and differences in experiences of children while they're still in the womb and being able to show causality to differences in outcomes in employment and earnings when they're in their, when they're in their adulthood, in their 30s and 40s. Remarkable research, but it's, there's a whole body of this now by some of the best scholars in the United States and across the world showing that there is this direct connection. So inequality obstructs opportunity um, through both hoarding opportunity and, and keeping it down at the top and obstructing it from moving from the bottom up. And then third, inequality subverts the institutions that manage the market. And we can see this, I, I think, in a variety of ways around us. And there's a lot of research here pulling on not just economics research, but also research from political science and sociology and legal scholarship and history that shows how um, inequality is distorting our institutions. It's distorting our political process. It is now well known in political science that the polarization in our politics is correlated with the polarization in our economy. And we also know that as we've seen more, fewer and fewer people with more and more money, they are able to have a, an, a, an effect on political outcomes that is far disproportionate to those who don't have money and power. So this is a, you know, a, basic, uh, a, a basic set of evidence that is coming out from political science. And of course, that's also connected to the capacity of institutions that had supported the middle class, like unions, to be able to have the bargaining power. Those have also been undermined in recent decades as well, and it's connected to inequality. At the same time, inequality is also subverting our labor market institutions in really profound and important ways. Um, so I've just finished, this is a, this, this lecture today, talk, not lecture, but this conversation is, um, I don't want to lecture at people who are eating lunch. That sounds horrible and very unpleasant for you all. Um, but this, is, this comes from a book that I've just uh, finished um, that'll be out next year. And um, in it, I, I talk about, um, at the very end, sort of what's happened to the labor market, and particularly what's happened to the labor market for economists. So if you want to know more about that, I'm going to, this is my little pitch, it, a year from now you'll have to read the book, because I'm not going to tell that story today. But, um, but what we are seeing is that people with power in the labor market are able to use that power to subvert the sort of the basic equation that I learned in my labor markets class that wages are equal to marginal product. There is now extensive evidence that, that shows the role that um, institutions play, labor market institutions and workplace institutions play in determining what people are paid. We also see things like discrimination playing a big role, as it turns out, in what people are paid or whether or not they're able to get a promotion without doing things that I'm sure many of us would consider completely unsavory. Um, and that those are all ways that inequality works its way through and distorts the labor market. Anything that distorts the labor market and means that wages aren't being paid their marginal product distorts product as a, as a negative effect on productivity because then you're not rewarding productivity, you're rewarding something else. So we're not really getting what we thought we were getting in the labor market in many ways and in no small part because of rising inequality. 
So um, this story that I've told you, it's a bit, um, I think of it sometimes, and it seems a little bit messy, right? There's, there's a lot of different disparate pieces of evidence that you have to pull together to tell this story about whether and how inequality is affecting our economy. And what I'm trying to do is to share with you that there's a lot of different pieces of evidence evidence that, it, that for the most part is based on big data that's showing causality, but that you can weave this all together to tell this story that is, that is quite coherent about the ways that inequality distorts and obstructs and subverts our, our, the institutions that lead to growth. And um, I also just want to emphasize that while I started off with a story about what's going to grow America's middle class, a lot of the evidence I'm talking about is about what's going to create long-term growth. I'm not rejecting the idea that we need to see productivity growth or that growth matters. But the argument I'm trying to pull from this evidence is that unless we attend to inequality and address its implications, that not just it does not just affect those families in the bottom 90 percentile, 90 percent of us who aren't gaining from growth, to the extent that the economy is growing on average, but it actually has a feedback loop that is going to continue to drag down our economy moving forward. So it's a yes and story. It's not an either or. And when I took economics, when I was in graduate school, and Harry Holzer is like sitting here staring at me in front of me, and I'm, I don't know that I want to hear your questions today, Harry, but, I, but if you have some, I'm, I'm happy to indulge you. But, th but when we took economics, we learned that that wasn't the way the economy worked. And so right now, I think there is the ground is shifting under economics in many ways. There's new stories that need to be told. Last night, um, I was with Emmanuel Saez, who gave a keynote at, um, at an event I was at, who said very, you know, very plainly that if the evidence doesn't fit the theory, we need to change our theory. And I would argue that that's the moment that economics is in right now. There's a lot of evidence that just doesn't really gel with this standard story. And it's going to take some work to put that all together. And what I'm trying to do for you today is to make the best sense of it that I can. So um, I want to end, well, I have three slides that I want to end with. And then I'll let you ask some questions. So um, one thing that we learn from Piketty is that if we don't actually do anything about this, he argues that wealth will continue to increase. He argues that these income concentration that we're seeing, the slides I showed you at the beginning were about income, that if we don't address that, we will see that those incomes calcify into stocks of wealth, and we will see ever increasing wealth inequality. So this chart is for the United States, showing the top 1%, the top 0.1% data going through 2013, showing wealth concentration in the United States. It's a U-shaped curve. It's actually quite a little bit steeper than the U-shaped curve that Piketty Saez show for income, but showing this wealth concentration. So, and if you care about capitalism, and you think that what makes the free market great is that people with good ideas can get some capital and go out there and make something new and exciting, then you have to care about wealth concentration, because those two ideas do not go hand in hand. And then, of course, you can add to this the share of wealth held by the bottom 90%. And that just is a, it's a little mountain. And we're, we're, on, we're sliding down the other side. I don't have any more, well, I have one more depressing slide. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to put up a slide on policy implications, not the depressing one. Um, just some ideas that um, I have been thinking about in terms of, OK, what does this mean in terms of policy? Where do we need to go? And the way I've been thinking about it is that we have a set of policies that regulate the market in various ways. And um, I think there, there's a number that we have in place that we need to, that have been eroded over time, that we need to figure out how to update, and then a number of places where we need to modernize our thinking, right? So over a century ago, we did something about the concentration of capital. So if I go back, oh, I can't go back. Mike, can you go back one slide? Oh, he's gone. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I did not mean to make you run across the room. So if you go back to this slide and you see, thank you, if you see this concentration of wealth, you see this also happened at the early part of the 20th century. You don't have data going further behind that because, of course, this data is from the income, uh, the income tax data. We didn't have an income tax before um, the early part of the 20th century. But in the you know, late 1800s, early 20th century, we did something about the concentration of capital. We implemented antitrust laws and the like. 
but those have been eroded over time. So we need to think about that. We need to think about taxation and hidden wealth overseas that we're not taxing. Do we think more about taxing wealth, not just income in this era of rising inequality? We need to think about the role of unions and the bargaining power of workers. And do these institutions make sense for today's economy? Because they may not. So how do, we, how do we update them or modernize them? And then, of course, there's a whole bunch of new areas we need to think about. We need to think about the role of platform firms. Are they, should they be in the marketplace? Are they actually public utilities? What role are they playing in our democracy and our economy? And a number of issues, which I'm happy to talk about. But I want to get to, to one point that I think is actually very important, which is that in this era of unshared growth, our metrics about what's good for the economy need to change. So the most important way that we measure economic outcomes is through gross domestic product, right? So when the president talks about the success or failure of his tax cuts, he got very excited when growth in the second quarter was 4.1%, because he went out there and Kevin Hassett, the chair of the CA, went out there and they said, this is evidence that our policy is working. Well, as those first slides I showed you showed, Having just aggregate growth isn't enough, right? You could have the economy grow, but if the bottom 90% of us aren't feeling it, is that success? I mean, maybe that's success. It's success for the people that are gaining, but that's not success for a democracy, I would argue. So this chart shows um, annual uh, per capita growth in national income, which is essentially equivalent to GDP, a gross domestic product, um, over, over time. And um, I think what we need to do is start looking at this metric differently and disaggregate it so that we actually look in real time when we see GDP growth, who it's actually going to. So what this chart shows is breaking down GDP growth, national income growth, into its components. How much is going to the bo bottom 50%? How much is going to the next 40%, top 10% and the top 1%? So if you're seeing green, and apologies to anyone who's colorblind, but if you're seeing a lot of green on this chart, that means that most of GDP growth in a given year is going to people in, who have incomes in the top 1%. But if we used this as our metric of success, I don't have this data going to the second quarter of 2018, but you know, what does that mean for the success of something like the tax cuts? If it is creating growth, that's awesome. I'm totally down with that. But what I care about is whether or not all those other kids in the United States all across America are worried about whether or not they can get their, you know, stay on their swim team and do the things that are important to them and their families. And to do that, we need to actually start unpacking what we mean by growth and who it goes to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. Well, I could ask Heather questions all day, but I want to try not to do that and want to make sure that I give you all time to ask questions. So if Harry or anyone else has questions for her, <laughs> please, uh, we will have a couple mic runners. Um, so please just raise your hand uh, and ask away. If not, I will get it started. Oh, we have a plenty. There's a mic right behind you. If you thank you. Yeah, I'm Jim Morrison. I'm a faculty member in, in, in the School of Public Policy Administration. Um, I'm really curious about the demographics. You really don't talk about the demographics as a, as a major factor because, um, as we all know, the society in general is changing in terms of age. And uh, also, we have immigrants, right? Large number of immigrants. And what effect does that have you know, on, on what your, uh, your, I guess you're suggesting about growth? Yeah, should we take a couple questions or should I go one by one? Up to you. Can we take a couple questions and that way I, that's also a, an opportunity for me to pause and think about each of Great. them. Great, we'll package them together. There's one right behind, right by One right, right behind you. Oh, great. Okay, I'll go there. Hi, I wanted, uh, I'm, I'm very much with you on thinking that we need some better metrics and one that's uh, been elusive is trying to measure the people working in the gig economy. Mm. So not people, just people who are in non-employee firms, but um, you know, people who are working in those on-demand jobs and contract positions and all those jobs that with fluctuating income. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. How you doing? Lincoln Farquharson from Rutgers University in Newark. Newark, right? Newark, New Jersey. 
Um, you know, forgive me because I only took two classes, macro and micro, and I got C's in both of them. <laughs> um, but one thing stuck with me was the understanding of equality. As a minority, you know, equality is a constant conversation in our circles, right? Um, but what I've realized is that equality is like a dream in capitalism because capitalism is guarded by competition, right? You can't have true capitalism without competition. And so competition therefore affects everything, right? Not just the business sector, but our social sectors too, because everything needs money. And there's just never enough resources to provide the services. And so when you're competing from the womb, how is opportunity then given equally? Now, I'm not saying that everyone should run away from capitalism. And I'm not just saying that because socialism has equal opportunity that everyone is just successful. But when we talk about equality and leveling the playing field, can we truly do that knowing that there's always going to be these measures that's just naturally built in place, right? Whether that's someone can afford health care, you know, working for public institutions, we all benefit from great health care benefits, right? $10 for, some, for a pill that costs $3,000. But if you don't have access to those things, which there isn't enough of going around, how can we truly talk about equality in capitalism? In the, how can we talk about equality and capitalism in the same conversation, right? How, why are we not talking about how to manage capitalism so that the effects of inequality is not felt so drastically? Yeah. These are all, all great questions. Um, I will uh, take them in, um, in order. So um, the question about, so demography certainly both, I, mean, I and well, actually I'm going to take this question over here because I think these two questions are related a little bit more. So your question about the gig economy is very important. Um, uh, I spent too much time on my phone this morning on the train up. I was a little obsessed with some news that's going on today. Um, but one of the things that, that came across my, my Twitter feed, because I follow mostly economists and other people like that, um, uh, so in between all the interesting stuff, was this story that actually the new data from the Contingent Worker Survey is out today. So um, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be, um, but I believe that I read that, um, so, the, so the, num the share of people who are in the gig economy is, is quite small. And I think I read this morning that it was about, it's about 1% of the labor force, which seems to gel with other evident, other things I've heard. Someone can, who has a phone could fact check me if they want to. Um, but, um, but that is not to say that it's not important. And I think there are, there are really two things. First, maybe three, but first is that Part of you know what we think of with the gig economy is that this is part of the workers who are um, in precarious positions. So you don't have to get a job on your phone to have a precarious kind of job. And so understanding that this is part of a spectrum of jobs that have unstable hours, that are unpredictable, um, that may not be permanent, is an important facet. Um, second is that just because you can do it on your phone does not make it cool, right? Or it does not sort of um, obscure the fact that people need good jobs. Um, but it, uh, but it does also, I think, bring to the forefront that we've had this, we have this sort of this tension um, that's been going on in our labor market for over a century, which is if you formalize employment, we, I mean, our strategy is, as in the United States has been to formalize employment, and then employers provide benefits and job security and all the, you know, in retirement and healthcare, and we do that through employment. And then if you're, and, and so we've, we've really focused on limiting the informal labor market, which is what the gig economy and these precarious jobs are. But now you have these new industries that are very excited about being able to have people have flexibility, which m many people don't get on their job, the voluntary flexibility that they want. I mean, if you ask any, I mean, I always ask drivers whenever I'm in a, an Uber, which I don't take Uber, but Lyfts, <laughs> and um, anytime I'm in a Lyft, and you know, they're all excited about their job. I mean, I've yet to meet one who complained to me, and that could be sample selection bias, but they're, they're saying, oh, I do this because I enjoy the flexibility. Well, that's a really important value that most people can't get in the formal labor market. But at the same time, 
then they're not getting those benefits. They're not getting health care. They're not getting that retirement plan. And I've been in many rooms, and I'm, I'm guessing many of you have been as well, where people from that industry are like, are, have said, oh, I'm, I would really be interested in having that conversation about what they call portable benefits. And I look at them and I'm like, that's great. Let's talk about adding paid family medical leave to Social Security and shoring up the retirement benefits. Because that's literally what you're talking about. Oh, and let's talk about universal health care, because that's, that's what a portable benefit is. Social Security, it's a portable benefit. Um, and they, they haven't actually stepped up and joined that, those, those campaigns. But I'm optimistic that it might be in their business interest to do so. But I think we need to be thinking about it, that we need to think about both Addressing people's need for flexibility, which is really important in a world where no, where very few families have full-time stay-at-home caregivers or when we have lives, that's important. Well, at the same time, making sure that these are good jobs and that requires thinking about there are other ways to make them good jobs than just making them formal employment, but that requires thinking about the role of, so, of essentially social insurance. So that would be my answer there. Over here on the demography and the, the equity, I think that they're connected because um, the demographic issues are, um, uh, you know, certainly important. We have a, we are living in an aging labor force, but um, these uh, the folks that are coming up, sort of right behind me, the millennials. That's also a, a big, uh, huge, um, uh, uh, large population, you know, uh, group that is coming up behind. So you do have these twin things going on, um, and of course, uh, immigration. I mean, what we know about. Um, so I'm not so so those affect growth in various you know different ways right because we know that the aging of the population has an effect on savings and invest have, you know because people are both savings as they're getting closer to retirement and are presumably going to be taking their savings out as they're in retirement has an effect that um, economists estimate that this is going to have a very long term. Uh, uh, a push on long-term interest rates that's going to last for decades, which, which is a very interesting challenge when you're thinking about then what do you do for macroeconomic stability and what does that do to investment? Um, so those are questions that we need to, do need to be thinking about. And of course, immigration um, is uh, you know one of the most important ways that the economy grows is through a growing population, right? And a growing skilled population that can be those good, uh, highly productive workers, but also creating that demand. And we know that immigration has done that in our country and around the world. And so uh, you know, whether or not we continue to have this, high, this fairly high level of immigration or whether or not we uh, close that down just as the moment where we're having this huge retirement boom, and these are, these are very important long-term macroeconomic questions. But when you started talking about demographics, I actually thought you were going to say, um, you know, gosh, Heather, you didn't say anything about race or gender in your slides, which I often get. And there's only so much you can say, and I try to keep it to 20 minutes, and I try not to overwhelm people. But um, those play, of, and so I think this segues into to, to your question. Um, I didn't catch your first name, but I did remember Rutgers, so that's probably important, right? Um, uh, but I think this question about uh, equity is so, so, so important. Um, I mean, I would say two things. First is that. If you don't have that level playing field or that, that generational reboot, then of course that has an effect as to whether or not that next generation has the same opportunity. And for decades, we saw generation after generation, year after year, there was this, this sense of a reboot, right? So the next generation of kids coming up had the same kind of access to schooling and to um, uh, the, the same income growth and were able to take advantage of opportunities to some extent that they are not today because you're not seeing that, that intergenerational reboot. And that is having, uh, you know, there, is, there are so many new papers that have come out in the past four or five years that are showing just how detrimental that is and the really important race and gender implications therein. So one is some work, um, on patents that shows that, um, so what the researchers did is very cool. They got data on whether or not people get a patent when they're a grown up and how much income they earn. So if we were all um, people, we are all people, but if they got data on us, they would be like, oh, this table over here, they all have patents, but they knew how much income we made. And then they got data on um, test scores, all of our test scores, when we were in third grade and how much our family income was in third grade. 
So income on like, you know, and, and test scores, you know, when you're a kid, and then do you get a patent to see whether or not people who have aptitude to become innovators actually become innovators as adults. Now we can have long discussions about patents. That's not really the point of this. If you're an economist, you're like already going out patents. Okay, fine. But, um, but it's whether or not people who, are, who have the aptitude to become innovators actually get that opportunity. And as it turns out, you know, kids that score really good on math tests when they're in third grade are much more likely to grow up and be innovators. Well, that, that makes sense, right? But actually, once they started overlaying race and gender and income on top of that, it actually turns out that that's really true if you're a rich kid, right? So rich kids that do well grow up to be patent holders. But if you're a smart kid, but you did not grow up in a, in a wealthy family, much less likely to grow up and be that patent holder. Huge implications for growth. And those numbers look worse for women and people of color than they do for whites. So, um, and, and then one of the really, really, really interesting things to come out of their work and economists, we come up these, with these policy recommendations that sometimes seem a little, I don't know, but here's one. Mm -hmm. They recommend um, more of a focus on mentorship, of especially um, girls and people of color. Because what makes the difference, in, they found in their research, is whether or not kids actually know somebody that looks like them, that gets into those patent kinds of jobs. And the, the research, and there's, I've seen a number of studies on this, and you can tell from my tone, I wasn't really inclined to believe this because it doesn't seem like a big idea. But in fact, um, there's a lot growing evidence that um, if you expose children to uh, you know, women physicians or black engineers, lo and behold, kids think, wow, I could grow up and be that. For me, the most compelling was when a bunch of economists did this with girls who study economics in high school. Evidently, if they meet somebody like me, they're more likely to be an economist, which actually was a little bit of fire under my you know, feet to go out and actually talk to more young people. So that's good. But, um, but these all play, this reboot really does play a role. But your point about inequality at the end is really important because, yeah, there's competition and there's going to be winners and losers. And the question, though, is do we have winners and losers at both ends of the game, right? Do you only, does your team only get like one group of people or do you get sort of all the different talented people? Is there like a fair setting of the teams at the beginning of the game and then made the best team win? Or do you put all the good players on one team and you, you stack the deck? And that's what we're doing now. And so, and I think that, and that's why I, my last chart before I got to the disaggregating growth was on wealth because part of what we're doing is we're stacking the deck for the next generation. And we didn't used to do that. And now we think that that's OK. So I actually think it's, competition isn't bad, but unfair competition, where the rules are totally stacked against some people, isn't, I mean, that's, and that, that's not good for the game, right? It, it just, it, under, it subverts everything. Let's keep the conversation yeah. going and do another round of questions. See one back there. Given that I think that everything you said is true, without question, given, however, the fact that it seems to me the, the way we have addressed a similar issue in the past is through our Congress. Um, I think that would be the primary agency, although also in our past we had an administration that rather directly tackled robber baronship, which we don't really have now. Not only that, but we don't really have a Congress just now who looks as though it would be very much in favor of tackling the advantage, the political power and money advantage of the rich, because many of them are receiving a great deal of support to get reelected through those people. Um, how do you see change, actual implementation of the policies you're recommending implemented? Do we want to collect a couple more questions? Yeah. Uh, you think that through? Excellent. We have one back there and one up here. One up here. If you want to raise your hand. Yeah, he's going to come. We're going to do this one first, but then we'll come to you. Hi. So my name is Sonia Siddiqui. I'm a first year PhD student. And my main issue, I'm not an economist by any means, but just in the brief understanding I've had of taking econ courses, my issue is um, just understanding 
economics as a whole and how is the game of economics really an equitable one? So if we make other things equal, then economics, if it functions regularly, that's going to be the, the goal? Or is it like, because just in terms of effective demand, if people don't have effective demand, they're not even considered part of the conversation. And so is that an economic issue or an equity issue? Also, something that I can't help but be reminded of is during slavery times, how and you mentioned this, like growth for who, how white economies grew and flourished, but black economies and are still to this day struggled and really struggle getting um, a footing. And so I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, I guess this is a big question, but I'm wondering if you think it, the way that economics was created is kind of dis disadvantaging some versus others in, from the onset, or if you think if we fix all of these equity issues, this will function the way it was intended. But thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Brent Melward. I'd like to go back to the, the first question. Uh, that question sort of dealt with the first Roosevelt administration and trust busting. And I'd like to move up to the second Roosevelt administration to the New Deal. And some have argued that sort of the principle, the principle of dealing with subverting institutions, uh, the strategy the Roosevelt administration engaged in was countervailing power. So wherever you found concentrated power, you tried to create power on the other side. So if these are two strategies, if you agree that those are two strategies that have been used politically in the past, what is your recommendation for the strategy today for dealing with the problems of people subverting institutions? Great, great questions. Um, so I will, uh, I'll, I'll probably mash them, uh, the answers up a little bit. Um, you, you know, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick. That wasn't actually about the antitrust right. It was about something else, but still, it's the image that sticks in my. I feel like I can see the little cartoon. Um, I will actually tell you a quick, quick sidebar. Uh, I hired an expert on my team who leads our antitrust work. And um, he told me that uh, when he was a little kid, he wanted to play football. Um, but his mom wouldn't let him. And then in his history book, he discovered Teddy Roosevelt, and he heard about these trust busters. So he would, decided he would do that instead. And he literally worked at the FTC for 20 years, and he's one of the world's best you know, trust buster kind of idea people. So these things can be very, they, they can be really, can be exciting to be an economist. That's all I'm saying. Um, just, just throwing that out there, you know. Um, it's not scary. Um, but uh, so I think that that is, um, so, so I think the reason I want to take these two answers together is because you said, OK, well, so we're in this scenario where we've allowed inequality to get so bad. We've allowed this wealth to concentrate. We've allowed this to corrupt our politics, right, through all the money in politics. So what do we do? And I can you know, list out a bunch of things that um, may seem pie in the sky. I spent uh, the mid-aughts working on paid family medical leave. OK, that, that, may not, that may not pass in this Congress in the way that I would like it to. But over the past decade, we've seen now six states put in place paid family and medical leave programs, giving people universal access to this really important social insurance benefit. New Jersey being the second state to do that after California did it 14 years ago. So part of my answer is actually that I think that we've put too much emphasis on the federal. I and mean, we live in this federalist the system, right? There's, I mean, I think many of you are not that you're thinking at the state and local level. If I'm not, if I'm understanding my crowd here, right? That these are really important places where we should be thinking about what policies can we do, um, and how can we make sure that those values aren't just all pushed onto the federal government, but are actually being um, focused on in state and local communities. And I think it starts by understanding that economic policies have really important feedback loops on people's ability to build power, and that there's other policies that you need to be thinking about that help people build power up and down the, like not just at the top of the income spectrum, but down the income spectrum. So what would that look like? How do you then, how do you make sure that our democracy is actually responding to the majority? Because one of the things that you see in this inequality literature in political science is that even if most people want a particular policy, 
unless the very wealthy also want it, it doesn't happen. And again, paid leave is a perfect example. This is a policy. There's not a poll out there that does not say that the majority of people would like us to have a national paid family medical leave policy. Every poll says that even the majority of Republicans want this. But it hasn't happened for a variety of reasons, but it hasn't happened because it hasn't been pushed by the top is one, one answer. I'm not sure that that's the right answer there, but, but that gets at this, at this challenge. So I think we have to be thinking at the state and local. We have to think about policies that build power. Certainly, um, unions were a place that created, uh, uh, created the weekend, created a strong middle class, gave people bargaining power, were a countervailing force. Did you know that we actually have fewer people as a share of the US economy in private sector unions than we did before we made them legal? So we actually have fewer people now than when than before. I mean, this is this is an amazing statistic. And you know, what happened is that it shot up in the 1930s after we made them legal, and then it just it just went down over time, which gets to the second point I wanted to make, which is that um, which I think actually gets to the, the students, your question, is that these policies aren't a one-time fix. I fear that one thing that happened is that we thought that, oh, we did those. Get, great, that's awesome, and we can just move on now and start just focusing on other things. But in fact, doing economic policy requires revisiting those on a regular basis, a yearly basis, to make sure that they're actually still functioning. And that once you start cycling out of control, you have to stop that then. It, it, like you can't just let that get a little bit out of control. So that's a, a, a number of, sort of perhaps disparate thoughts. But what do we do? Um, I think we need to focus on democracy. Um, I would argue that that's probably the first thing we need to do. That's not my area of expertise. Um, I think that there's a lot of people that do work on democratic reforms, around voting rights, around making sure that the voices of the American people are being heard. I think that is that is one big area, and I would argue that that is probably the most important first priority. But then second, um, I think we need to focus on the kinds of things that are going to have that lasting impact, and they're going to focus on the countervailing forces. I think that thinking about uh, monopoly power is a really important one. Thinking about the role of platform firms, and again, what, are they a utility? Are they not? Should they be regulated? How do we think about a small number of exceptionally wealthy humans owning so much of the gains from the accumulation of all of human knowledge, right, in the tech sector, uh, there's a very small group of people that are, that are able to capture these gains because they commercialize things that were invented by people decades before. They did not invent computers. They just were able to monetize this in a really specific way and make an, a lot of money, but also by capturing these whole markets that have no openness now. And there's a lot of research showing how the tech sector is closing down competition and openness um, it, uh, you know, across these platform firms. So thinking about that, and I think if for any of these solutions, it's going to require cross-country collaboration because these are not national problems, they're international problems. Um, and then I would argue that we need to start building the case for um, why we need to raise taxes. And, you know, we've lived through decades of tax cuts, and then we've lived through eras where um, it's so sad to have you talk over here that, well, we can't, both of you, I think, said, well, we can't afford things. Last time I checked, even though growth is slowed, we still live in one of the richest countries the world has ever seen. And that chart I showed you at the beginning showed you where all those gains are going. They're not going to the kinds of work and the communities that would, they're not going to communities all across America. The gains from growth are not being distributed. But that's also showing up in our state and local budgets, and it's showing up because we're not, we're not taxing the wealthy, we're allowing them to park a lot of their money overseas in hidden wealth. These are enormous challenges that are only going to get worse unless we deal with them. Now again, I'm not the political expert, so maybe I'm still giving you pie in the sky things that don't have a, a, a route, but these things are all popular and could be done, um, but they require building those that, that political coalition and deciding that this is the priority, that rewriting that, re rewriting these rules is the priority, not something, not something else that isn't going to build that power. I think I got to all those. So, Terrific. Thank you. We probably have time for two quick questions if we want to do them quickly. So we have one here, and then we have one over there. Hi, I'm Andrew Seligson. A uh, very quick question. How important are housing markets in this story? And 
uh, what should we be thinking about mostly? So is it about growing supply? I'm thinking about like the growth that happens in places like Boston and New York and Washington and San Francisco and the restriction on access to that for people who can never get into those housing markets. And is that about lowering the regulations on zoning, et cetera, from local governments? Is it about better policies on affordability? Is it about mortgage? Like what has to happen to change the dynamics on that? And also just how big a part of the story is it? Okay, thank you. And then last question. Hi, my name is David Wunsch, and I'm the director of the Delaware Geological Survey. Kind of a misfit in this crowd. And not only am I not an economist, I've never even had an economics class. Excellent. <laughs> Good. So I'm going to think a little bit out of the box here. And a lot of the presentations I've heard today, they're talking about everything from maybe higher taxation to equity of wealth and things. But it almost assumes that wealth is constant. It's there, and you take it and you move it around. But I look at the world from what about the upstream generation of wealth in the terms of all the products and things that really built the middle class. For example, the grass we saw from World War II through the 70s, not only did we make cars back then, but we had geologists explore for the iron that turned into the steel and then the steel rubber companies and, and all that was made here. Now, the service economy, I'm selling you my TV from my store and then I'm buying your Walmart stuff back. But there's not much being discussed about kind of that generation of wealth, which really powered the middle class growth because it had so many different offshoot type of industries. For example, uh, Stephanie Hoop's graphic she showed earlier with all the states by county and how much we're exceeding or, or, or not or within the poverty level of the Alice criteria. If you looked at the one state that kind of glowed out of there was North Dakota. It was the one that had the least amount of people in poverty. Why is that? Regardless of what you think of the fracking controversy, whatever, but it is an industry that has drawing natural resources. It's, it's building an industry on steel and all the other things that are ancillary to that, transportation, et cetera. So our economists, I guess, get to, to get to my question, our economists thinking about this upstream generation of wealth here within the country and, and the things that we can do to kind of build on the resources that we have here. For example, another presentation earlier showed that the, the type of jobs that are destined to decline in the future are farming and agriculture. Well, those are sustainable things. You can continually grow things. You can grow timber and make more things out of wood, and then you can grow more timber, especially with all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But uh, so, so that's my question is, you know, I think that's something that we're ignoring here. We have the technology to do a lot of things cleaner and better than we ever have. We export that technology to other countries, but we're kind of building ourselves into an island here where we can trade wealth around, but you've also got to be able to generate it from a, from a raw form all the way up. Yeah. Um, I'm, I think I understand your question, not being a geologist, um, but let me see if I do. I'll take a stab. Um, I think that you're talking about the role of resources in growth. Is that fair? Okay. And I mean, you know, and it's interesting, uh, you talked about trees and carbon and, and whatnot. Um, there, has been, there has been a lot of thinking and work done to think about the role of, um, you know, renewable energy as a, as a source of growth and tapping into, you know, wind farms and solar and as both something that could um, reduce our reliance on some of the things that we pull from the ground, but at the same time create that U.S.-based manufacturing base that could create those good jobs and has that positive feedback loop. Um, so certainly economists have thought a lot about that, um, and that certainly was a big policy during the Obama years, um, not such a, uh, not, not one that's being um, pursued as much today. But I think the other thing that, um, well, I'll stop there because I don't know much more about that, so I'll, I'll pause there. I don't know that I have anything else to say on that. And on housing, such an important issue, right? Housing is the most important asset for most families. Um, it, you know, of course, the collapse of the housing bubble had the capacity to destroy the American economy. So, um, you know, what happens to this asset is is critical. Um, and I, and you brought up, you know, there's a whole set of issues that people are talking a lot about these days, which is that there's some communities. And you mentioned them, New York, San Francisco, um, and other places where housing has become so expensive that people can't actually, people who have just regular jobs can't live there. This poses big problems for transportation. One of the recent papers that um, uh, one of my colleagues has been working on you know, talks about how 
If you have to commute longer to work, that reduces your chances of upward mobility. So um, housing and transportation actually has a big effect on the ability of people to find the most productive match in terms of their jobs. So again, it's not just the wealth stock, but what wealth creates in terms of productivity and job matching, and of course, school matching, what kinds of schools. Um, so I would say that it's, it, is, uh, it is very much at the core. Um, it is beyond my area of expertise to really know with a clear sense all the things that we need to do. Certainly affordable housing is one. The, um, the issue of whether or not we, the issue of how to take those communities where you have all these people that want to move there who have so much money that they've been able to bid up prices so much and some people are saying, well, what we just need to do is we just need to get rid of all the housing regulations and just let the market take care of itself. I am not inclined to think that that is the best, um, a priori, that doesn't, I'm, I have concerns as to whether or not that's the best approach. While I recognize that problem, and I do recognize that that is some people holding on to wealth, right, in San Francisco, if you don't know this, they have this interesting rule where you have um, uh, per, in perpetuity rights to the view. So if your home has even the slimmest view of the bay, that view can be preserved so nobody can build anything that can obstruct that view because that's your property right. So whether or not you take those rights away, I mean, these are these are big questions. But there's also a, a small d democracy question, right? Where, where is the ability of local communities to make decisions about uh, community regulations around housing and, and what their communities are going to look like? And it it um, I think those 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 seem, in, at least to my mind, in the debate to be in tension. But again, this is not my area of uh, first expertise. But I'm glad you brought it. I'm glad you brought it up. We have a whole separate panel on housing policy. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we only have a few minutes left, uh, but Heather, uh, we have a lot of really great minds in this room, and I know many of them have been working with policymakers for years, and others maybe have not yet uh, worked with, closely with policymakers and are interested in using some of their really great research and better influencing policymakers. I know that's what you do uh, as your day job, so I was wondering if you would take the last few minutes and talk a little bit about the Washington Center for Equitable Growth and how those who are interested in uh, translating their research into policy uh, might work with you or approach uh, that effort. Oh, I'm so glad you asked this question. Um, very happy to talk about it. Um, so five years ago, uh, I co-founded with John Podesta the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Um, John actually left me a, a week later to go back to the Obama administration. <laughs> so he was there for the party and then just abandoned me. <laughs> the good me. part. Yeah, the good part. Um, and uh, But we launched with the purpose of um, advancing evidence-backed ideas and policies to promote growth that is strong, stable, and broadly shared. And as Stephanie, you said at the beginning, and you did this lovely introduction, which I really appreciated, we have a very unique institutional model. Um, we're not like any other think tank in DC, um, because we feel that for too long, all of this really wonderful research, policy relevant research, has been hiding in plain sight out there in the academy. Um, and from my perspective, running a nonprofit, um, there's all of these scholars who have full-time jobs and are looking for good ideas of things that would be really useful to the policymaking process. And what we do is we try to connect the dots between the policymaking community and scholars that are interested in making a difference. And we give grants to scholars to study things that matter. Um, so we have an open and competitive grant program. Our call for proposals goes out in November. We also have an in-house postdoc or pre-doc program. Um, and we give out grants to, to PhD students as well. Um, about two-thirds of our funding goes to economists. About one-third goes to people in other social sciences that we're excited about, occasionally even lawyers, uh, legal <laughs> scholars. Um, I think we funded three of those. They're all wonderful. Um, they don't, they're empirics, but that's fine. Um, but uh, we fund scholars to investigate whether and how inequality affects in, um, economic growth and stability in all its forms. So any ways that inequality could have an effect on the economy, we're interested. Um, our RFP has some very specific uh, places each year that we're focused on, but, um, and we often have funded a lot of work using big data. And then my team of almost 35 people in Washington now, they spend their time identifying the policymaking communities that can make the most of that work. And we host a lot of convenings bringing together these two communities and um, making sure that the research um, is accessible and relevant to important policy debates. Um, 
And nothing makes me happier. I actually was sitting over there spending way too much time again on Twitter where I both read about the contingent worker survey, but then I also came across this really cool article in the Wall Street Journal, I think today, um, about really interesting work on scheduling stability. I was like, oh, that sounds fantastic. And that's actually one of our working papers. <laughs> um, so we published uh, papers and we get them into the media and, um, and my team does this amazing job of getting uh, hitherto uh, uh, unknown scholars uh, work, the recognition it deserves to help shape our national debate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Heather, uh, I always learn so much from listening to you, and we really appreciate uh, that you were willing to come up here and join the conversation today. Was... So thank you for your time. And if everyone would join me in thanking Heather again. Thank you.